Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Katie Starr, and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage marketing team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is a family-owned business located in southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're here to serve you and your animals with consistent, high-quality nutrition and valuable education to keep them happy and healthy. Welcome to our educational webinar titled, How to Decrease Your Horse's Risk of Colic with Nutrition Management. Colic can be a very worrisome experience for any horse owner. Throughout this presentation, we will discuss ways to minimize your horse's risk of colic, focusing on the psychological stress of feed management and just how important forage is to the overall health of your horse. If you happen to be new to joining our webinars, we'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. If you're viewing this as a recording, feel free to skip over this section. As a heads up, we will have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us till the end. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have an opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Depending on how many questions that come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached a nutritional paper associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. For those viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the handout titled, How to Decrease Your Horse's Risk of Colic with Nutrition Management. This is a great take home piece for this webinar. And you'll see a screenshot here of our website with some helpful educational content under nutritional resources, including our past webinars we've recorded, along with other nutritional white papers and a lot of other content. And that's all I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage Equine Nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share a little bit more about herself before she begins the presentation. Hi, Katie, and thank you all for joining the webinar tonight. As Katie mentioned, I work with uh, Performance Horse Nutrition and we work with Stanley Premium Western Forage. And I, I really value our partnership because as an equine nutritionist, I value the importance of forage in the horse's diet and really like working with some of the leaders in um, the forage industry being Stanley Premium Western Forage. So without further ado, we'll get going. I wanna talk about how to decrease your horse's risk of colic with nutrition management. Now, as we go through the presentation, you will notice that we won't be talking um, about the typical symptoms of colic, signs of colic, what to do if your horse is colicking, but I really wanna talk more about what is normal for a horse, I always think it's really important to start out with talking about what's normal so that we can understand how when we deviate from that, that can cause some issues. Um, and then look at different stresses that we put on horses. And all of these stresses exacerbate our horse's risk for colic. And we'll look at some of the mechanisms behind that stress-related colic, um, some of the benefits of forage. And then also, I think a lot of people have a good handle on the quantity of forage they need to feed. But now it comes down to that feeding management. How can we mimic that grazing behavior um, in our stabled horses? 
So we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to talk about normal foraging behavior. What is normal for horses? On the left-hand side, you see a group of horses grazing on a field that looks like it contains some grasses, some forbs, different legumes, lots of variety of different past, uh, grass and, and plant species there. And that is normal for horses to eat a wide variety of forages. They are a fiber-based um, herbivores. They graze continually. They move while they eat. They do like to, to live in herds. They're, they're herd animals. They're very social. And they also eat off the ground. And when they put their head all the way down on the ground to graze, that increases the natural drainage of the respiratory tract. It significantly increases chewing time, which has you know a trickle down effect, a real ripple effect on, on, on good benefits to the horse's health. Uh, it maintains uh, proper teeth alignment and it decreases some of that muscular tension in the neck and back that horses can get when they're yanking out of a hay net higher up. Now, unfortunately, not all of us have that much pasture or that much land where we're going to put all our horses out together and let them graze 24-7. And, and we're at the mercy of our surrounds and most horses have to live in stalls. And it doesn't matter whether you live in New England or in Wyoming or in California or Texas or Florida, most of our performance horses spend the majority of their time living in stalls. And they eat a cereal grain based diet because we are expecting them to do high amounts of exercise, multiple babies, maintain body weight, um, in doing this, this increases the acidity of the overall GI tract. Some horses really don't mind the confinement, but others, it can really stress them out, that lack of socialization. And, and of course, we know some horses do a lot of exercise and others do none. One of the big things I want to point out about this picture is on the wall, you see a feed bucket hanging at chest height. And that's pretty common for us to to hang a bucket at chest height to feed our horses, but that does not put that horse's neck in the right, correct anatomical position for chewing. It should be closer to the ground. Pasture provides a continuous intake of fiber. Um, you know, some people call horses trickle feeders because they're designed to have a small amount of food continually trickling through the digestive system. That is how their digestive system, it works the most efficiently. There are other things that pasture provides. Well, number one, exercise. You know, if your horses have 24-hour um, access to pasture, they may walk up to nine and a half, 10 miles, but if you only put them out half the day, then that's really significantly cut down to maybe two and a half to three miles. Pasture office also provides socialization and natural foraging behavior. Most horses don't just stand in one spot and eat. They'll walk over to different parts of the field. They'll put their head under the under the fence. They're, they're exhibiting that natural foraging behavior, picking at lots of different um, plant species. Now, this is actually a graph of consumption of pasture throughout the, the months of the year. And it, it makes a whole lot of sense if we think March, April, May is spring, September, October um, is really our fall months. We know that the grass, pasture grasses, there's an influx of growth in the spring and also in the fall. Also, those grasses get a bit sweeter tasting. So there would be an increase in uh, amount of forage consumed during those months. But another thing that I want to point out is free ranging horses tend to show about 10 to 15 distinct feeding bouts within that 24 hour period. So they don't eat once or twice a day, not even three or four times a day. They eat 10 to 15 times a day. Um, so I think it's really important to remember that when we're providing our horses with feed and hay. Uh, we don't want to make we want to make sure that they don't go more than, say, three to four hours without having something to eat. If we think about that bottom jaw, it works independent of the top jaw and it works in a circular motion. And I like to point out this picture on the uh, bottom left here. If we're looking at that outer loop, that's when the that's the motion of that bottom jaw going around in that circular motion when the horse is eating long stem hay or pasture. Now that shorter loop on the inside is when they're eating pellets, grain, or even a pelleted forage. They have a much shorter jaw sweep, maybe not so much an even wear on those teeth, uh, chew a lot quicker. 
The other thing I want to point out is when horses have ad lib access to pasture, they're out there grazing 24 hours a day. They will chew about 60,000 times a day. And when we put horses in the stall and get them to eat hay and grain, we might monitor that they only chew about 30,000 times a day. So we significantly cut down the amount of chews, which is saliva production, et cetera. I want to show you this study done by some folks in, in Europe. And I really think it points out that horses are smart and they will get what they need, even if we don't provide it for them. It doesn't necessarily mean they're getting what they need from the best sources though. So this was a group of 36 three-year-olds and they split them into two groups. They were either giving them a lot of forage and a little bit of concentrate or not a lot of forage and a lot of concentrate. And I wanna to skip to the end of the graph first and show you that the total amount of observed time of these horses eating anything was the same. There was no difference between the groups, whether you gave them a lot of hay and a little grain or a lot of grain and a little hay. Come back to the beginning of the graph and you can see that the, the gray bars represent the high forage diet and the white bars represent the low forage diet. And the amount of time it took for these horses to eat the ration that we provided them, so the hay and grain we provided them, it now makes sense that if you give them a lot of grain and a little bit of hay, it doesn't take them long to eat that. So the white bars represent that. And the gray bar they're showing when you give horses a high amount of forage and a little bit of concentrate, it takes them much longer to chew. So then if we end up in the middle of the graph here, what I think is very telling is what on earth are the horses that got the low forage diet doing for the rest of the time so that when observers look at the total time eating, there was no difference. What are they eating to make up the rest of their day? They're eating bedding and feces, significantly more time eating bedding and feces. Um, and we don't want our horses eating straw or shaving as it's non-digestible. They can pick up um, bad, bad bacteria. It can cause impaction colic, um, cause dental issues. We really don't want them eating bedding or feces. So make sure you're providing your horses plenty of forage. I'll turn it over to Katie for our first poll question. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. So our first polling question is, have you had a horse experience colic? And the options are just yes or no. So please just select um, your best choice and then click submit. And just a reminder, your specific answer won't be seen by any other attendees, but we will go ahead and view the total responses together once we close the poll. Okay, it looks like just about all of you have voted. So I'm gonna close the poll now and share the results with everyone. And it looks like Dr. Cubitt, we have had 84% of people say yes, they have had a horse experience colic. Oh, okay, yes, unfortunately, it's one of the, the biggest things that we fear as horse owners and managing horses is colic. So hopefully we can point out a few different management tips that you can implement in your facility to try and decrease that risk. So let's talk about stress in horses. As we know, stress really comes in many different angles when it comes to horses, whether it's that we're exercising them heavily, we're riding them in the hottest parts of the month is it, of the year as it heat stress, um, transporting them, unfortunately, we can't wave a magic wand and have the horse go from point A to point B and never have to get on the trailer or even a plane. Um, you know, injury and pain is common in our performance horses and that causes stress. There is documented research on all of these and how <clears throat> these create increased cortisol in the horse, which is a measure of stress. And then also that psychological stress, either being separated from their bodies, fear, or feeding management. And that's the one we're really gonna focus on today. So I wanna take you, We, you know, I think we have a bit of an idea of the, the kind of gross anatomy of the digestive system. Teeth, stomach, small intestine, colon, you know, we, we move from there. Um, but if we, go a little bit deeper if we look a little closer in the red box here is the edge of the um, intestinal wall and if we go to the left of your slide we can look at this pink graphic and that looks like a little finger and 
those fingers called villi line the surface of the intestines and really they are designed to increase the surface area so that we can absorb more nutrients along that intestinal wall if we go a little bit closer now into the black circle which is our graphic at the bottom right now we're micro microscopically honed in and we've got another set of little fingers on top of these cells but what i want you to look at is between these cells we have these little gates and we call them tight junctions and a healthy tight junction is nice and closed and and solid and it doesn't let anything leak back and forth and it only opens to allow um, digested food particles water glucose your minerals proteins amino acids through to go into the bloodstream off to their target organ but what happens, we know, we've documented that stress can actually, in, in any form, stress in general, can break down these tight junctions and allow undigested food particles, toxins, bacteria, whatever is, is floating in the, in the intestine, into the bloodstream and wreak all kinds of havoc. So we want to make sure that we're trying to decrease stress so that we can help to um, stabilize the intestinal mucosal integrity so what kinds of horses might be what, what might be the symptoms of a horse that has this stress related gut breakdown well they're prone to gastric and colonic ulcers they seem to have those chronically maybe you got a bit of a dull coat poor hooves multiple allergy symptoms now if we've got all this non-digested material flowing into the bloodstream it's not a true allergy like well your horse is allergic to alfalfa or, or to protein or whatever it's just a systemic allergy because you've got all this non-digested foreign material flowing into the bloodstream and we've got this systemic allergy that's saying you know there's something foreign here i've got to get rid of it so they exhibit these random unexplained allergy like symptoms sometimes if we use our classic um, ulcer medications it fixes the problem and then when you take them off after the course of treatment it rapidly reverts and you get this strong change in behavior and also chronic diarrhea and the typical horses that seem to be more susceptible are the high performance horses high amounts of stress that the, the management of these horses uh, nervous type horses horses that chronically colic um, antibiotics chronic pain even there's some link with equine metabolic syndrome maybe due to its inflammatory markers um, but also this psychological stress so i want to talk more about this psychological stress because we know that um, based on feeding management fear separation that we can increase the amount of cortisol which is a measure of stress in horses so we know that psychological stress is a real thing in horses as it is in other livestock and in, in people so i want to talk about the benefits of forage and in order to do that we need to start out with what is the minimum amount of forage that my horses need and you know while we're doing this this webinar live it's the winter for all of us and it's cold and most of our horses are 100 percent reliant on us for their forage requirements so that is a bare minimum of one percent of body weight per day so 10 pounds for that thousand pound horse typically i never go that low if i want my horse to lose some weight i'll put them on 1.2 percent of their current body weight be about 12 pounds of forage um or I usually recommend anywhere between one and a half to two and a half percent of body weight as my more ideal forage intake. So anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds of forage. Research has shown that if we feed less than that one percent of body weight, you can actually start to slowly kill off the intestinal lining because the intestinal walls are made up of smooth muscles and that constantly contract and push through food through. Um, and if those muscles aren't working continually, then we can get atrophy and we can get sloughing off of those cells. We, we want to make sure that we're feeding horses sufficient levels of fiber to keep that gut motility strong. Gut, if when you decrease gut motility, you definitely increase your risk of impaction colic. If we don't feed enough forage to our horses, we know that we have an acidity in the hind gut. We have colic, gastric ulcers, cribbing, wood chewing, behavior issues. Now, what I want to point out is all of these, so we've talked about colic there, but this hind gut acidity, this gastric ulcers, cribbing, wood chewing, different behavioral issues 
um, diarrhea. These may all be pre-signs that your horse is more at risk for colic. So if your horse is exhibiting all of these, you might want to keep a really good eye on them because the next thing might just be colic. I can't guarantee that it will or won't be, but um, this is just like a cascade of events that would lead up to decreasing the intestinal uh, permeability and increasing your horse's risk for colic. So next poll question. Thank you. Our second polling question is, do you use a hay net when feeding your horse or horses, hay or forage? And the options are yes or no. So please just go ahead and select the appropriate response and click submit. We'll wait a few minutes to let you all have your opportunity to vote. And it looks like just about everybody has voted. So we'll close the poll and share the results with everyone. And Dr. Cubit, so we have 60% say no, they do not use a hay net when feeding their horse hay. And 40% have said yes. Okay, excellent. Um, and no one's right or wrong. We're just gathering information so that we can understand our demographic better. So let's talk about feeding foragers. And ideally, what we want to do, go back to the very first slide and remember the evolution of the horse. What is the horse designed to do? He's designed to graze continually, have 10 to 15 feeding bouts throughout that 24-hour period. So if we want to decrease stress in these horses, this psychological stress by, by addressing feeding management, our whole goal is to mimic grazing behavior. And what tools can we use or implement in order to do that? One well, might be different, different hay bag options or different slow feeders. <clears throat> Let's start with feeding position. This is an easy fix. We talked about that putting that bucket at chest height being pretty common in most stalls. Well, if we look at, at the amount of jaw sweeps a horse will do when they're chewing from different positions. Let's say we put two pounds of grain or oats, pellets on the ground in a tub, the horse will chew that about a thousand times. If we put two pounds of hay on the ground, they'll chew about 2,000 times. Much, lo much longer time to, to break down that long stem hay. If we put two pounds of oats at chest height, however, they will chew about 350 to 500 times. So we've significantly decreased the amount of time it took them to chew it. So what are they going to do with the rest of the time? Maybe chew on wood, chew on shavings, eat manure and bedding. Um, and that you've also significantly decreased the amount of saliva which is produced, which is the first line of defense in buffering that stomach acid from not causing gastric ulcers. So what can we do? What can we add perhaps to the diet to slow down rate of intake? Well, there has been some suggestion that adding chopped forage to the concentrate may slow them down. And yes and no, if you just put in a couple of handfuls, then it won't do anything. But if you add in, 20 to 40 percent um, chopped forage into the diet, then that can definitely show them, slow them down by half to 100 percent. Um, some studies have also shown by putting in large quantities of oil, so one to two cups of vegetable oil into the feed, that can also slow them down. Um, if we use oral stereotypies, this biting, weaving, chewing, as measures of, as outward signs of stress, so this group measured those oral stereotypies when feeding different amounts of meals per day. So if you fed the horses just two meals a day, they exhibited more of these bad behaviors versus four to six meals a day, they really decreased those oral stereotypies and they were more content and had less stress. So again, these are just a couple of simple things that you can do, feed more frequently, put the feed closer to the ground, um, and maybe add some chopped forage or some oil, which is oil ideally if you need weight gain for your horse. Um, this study I really like because it's number one very rare that we see equine studies of such large numbers. So we have 100 mares. It's also sometimes difficult to measure sub objectively the outcome in equine um, trials because what is our measure of success? Uh, you can't use meat quality or egg production or milk production because these are not livestock. So it's hard to say, oh, did your horse jump higher or 
go in a circle better because there are so many other factors that play into that. But this group actually looked at reproductive efficiency. So they split the 100 mares into two groups of 50. And one group went out in a dry lot throughout the day and there was hay bags all around that dry lot. So these horses were allowed to eat food all through the day, about 11 pounds of hay each over the six hours that they were out in this dry lot. Then those mares came in at night and were in individual stalls, ate another 11 pounds of hay and some, some barley, some grain in their individual stalls. Now the other group of 50, they went out in a similar like dry lot, but they didn't get any hay during the day. They were just out there really annoying each other, trying to find their pecking order. They had nothing else to do, so they really did kick and bite each other all day. And they had they also came into stalls at night, individually stalled, but they had to eat all of their food at night. So the 22 pounds of hay and the grain, they had to eat all in those overnight hours. Now, what the authors did notice, what the researchers noticed is definitely the horses that were not allowed to eat during the day, they showed more agnostic or nasty behavior. They really were kicking and biting each other all day. And the other horses were very calm, just quietly consuming their hay. When we looked at overall fertility, the light gray bars, the mares that were allowed to eat continually, they had 81% overall fertility. And the mares that were not allowed to eat during the day, they had 53% overall fertility. Um, we know that stress can interfere with reproductive hormones, and this is a direct link to feeding management, increasing stress, and decreasing uh, the outcome of the, the measure of success here, which is fertility, something really measurable. So we definitely want to make sure that um, we're decreasing stress in, in our reproductive herds. So if it comes down to the, the grain that we're feeding them, or maybe we've got a senior horse uh, or a horse with poor teeth and we're feeding them 100% pelleted forage, and how on earth do we try and break that up throughout the day? How do we slow down their rate of intake? Or, um, this group in North Carolina actually looked at different methods, methods of slowing down rate of intake of the grain, and they found that this contraption here, this, this tub with the uh, dimples in the bottom, they called it a waffle feeder, uh, actually slowed the horses the most. Um, control was just a tub on the ground. So balls was a tub on the ground with bocce balls in it, and that didn't work because they just kicked the balls out. This waffle feeder here is this one shown in the picture, and C was actually just the control with water mixing in. Um, so I show you this one because this was looking at a s different hay net sizes. They either just put hay in the corner or they have large hay net holes that were six inches in diameter, medium sized holes in the hay net, 1.75 inches, or the small hay net size, whole size, which is uh, one inch or less. And it was the horses eating out of the small hay net. That was the one that actually increased the time it took to eat their hay the longest. So really what I, what I get out of that is if you're using a slow feed hay net and the whole size is larger than an inch, then it's not really a slow feed hay net. This was a novel group, and now this isn't going to work for every situation, and not everything here is going to work for every situation. So what I encourage you to do is listen to all the parts and then go back to your program and say, well, I could probably implement that, but that wouldn't work for me. So find the things that work for you. This group were fortunate enough that they never actually put hay or grain into the stall while the horses were in there. They always replenished the food and hay while the horses were out of the stall being tacked up, ridden, brushed, or out in the field. So they took away the anticipation of feeding. Um, and they also used these slow feeder type options here, um, which is a tub where we have this plastic liner on the top and it floats down. And it definitely decrease, increased the time it took for these horses to consume their food. Um, this was comparing all three options. So we've got hay in the floor. This is not a slow feed hay net. This is just a hay bag on the wall. And then this is one of your slow feed hay options here. And definitely these horses, A and C, they didn't stress out at all. A ate their food a little quicker than C. Um, but B, 
they noticed that these horses um, got more stressed and aggressive, yanking the hay out of um, this hay bag and they ate it pretty quickly. So really these slow feed options close to the ground are ideal if possible. One thing that I encourage you to be, be wary of when choosing or making your own slow feed is that we don't use slow feeders um, that have a metal grates or even hard plastic because it'll actually wear away at the horse's teeth. Uh, I like the idea of these hay pillows as well. It's kind of like one of those dog treat toys where the horse can have its head down on the ground and it kicks it around and that's another option. But the pitfall to that is you can't put a lot of hay in it at one time. Um, so forage type also plays into it. So we know that alfalfa is really high in calcium and so that helps buffer the stomach acid. Um, it's very highly digestible. It's You can replace some grain with alfalfa because it's high in calories and protein. So for, for performance horses, it's going to supply them with the, the calories um, that they might need for, for performance without having to go the route of adding a lot of extra grain that can um, increase gut upset. We also need to make sure, though, that when we're adding different forages and if you go back to the very first slide, you remember I say horses are adapted to eating a wide variety of forages, but they're also, as I just said, adapted. So you need to make sure that when you're making feeding changes, hay included, that we don't make rapid feeding changes. So we don't just randomly add some alfalfa or add some beet pulp. You want to make sure that just like feeds, you will gradually introduce the horses to those. So in summary, what do we want to do? We want to decrease the stress that we can control. As we mentioned, you're not going to stop exercising performance horses. You're not going to be able to take away the transport stress or the injury, but we can control feeding management. We have a direct control on feeding management. Don't feed less than one and a half percent of body weight. Mimic grazing, feed multiple sources of forage, and don't make rapid feeding changes, hay included. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt, for sharing some great insight into how we can minimize the risk of colic in horses with nutrition and feed management. Um, really quick before we get to the questions, I just want to remind you to download the nutritional paper that is available under handouts before we end the webinar. And we will be drawing our winner for free product coupons following our Q&A session. So please go ahead and stick around for that. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started on a few questions that were submitted during today's presentation. Again, please feel free to still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel if you would like. So Dr. Cubit, our first question is from Claire and Claire is wondering, are horses more at risk at this time of year? You know, Claire, that's a, that's a really good question. And I would say that, yes, I mean, stress could be a little higher this time of year. They're drinking less because it's frigid cold temperatures outside. They're not probably not getting out to exercise. Um, they're eating minimal amounts of forage that they're being provided in stalls. Exercise, as you know, anybody who's a runner, you know that exercise stimulates um, gut movement. That's as far as I'll say on that. But, you know, exercise in the horse too will, will stimulate gut movement. And so standing around in a stall, we see stocking up in the legs. Um, we've probably got the barns closed up because it's so cold outside. Um, and that can decrease air quality as well. So again, yeah, I, I would say that stress is heightened um, this time of year, just from a multitude of different factors. Perfect. And Virginia would like to know, what about a horse that has had colic surgery already? Is the feeding management different? You know, if a horse has had colic surgery in the past, it's kind of like a horse that's had laminitis. You know, you and and you get its body weight under control, and you get its crusty neck down forever. You will always be cautious about feeding that host laminated horse, and it's the same with a horse that's had colic surgery. You know that he was obviously at more risk of developing colic because he got it once. So maybe he's more at more likely. He maybe he's one of these candidates that might get it more frequently. 
Um, he's got some scar tissue there. So definitely I'll always treat a horse a little bit more cautiously that has colic in the past, and especially one that's gone as far as having surgery, that I'm making sure, number one, that they're drinking plenty of water. I don't want any kind of impaction colic to put any stress on the gut lining, um, making sure that we're not making any rapid changes in the feeding, anything that will upset those bacteria in the hind gut so that we don't want any excess gas production. Um, feeding highly digestible fiber sources this time of year when we're concerned about water intake, feeding them a wet mash every day. I like a beet pulp mash. I do not like to feed wheat bran to horses. It's very non-digestible, um, but a nice wet beet pulp mash every day gives you some good calories and gives you that moisture content with the really highly digestible fiber sources. Some even call beet pulp a prebiotic because it really helps to feed those bacteria in the hindgut. So hopefully some. Excellent. Yes. And um, going off of that, um, Kathy Jane um, has asked about suggestions on how to get a horse to drink. And I know you just mentioned beet pulp. Do you have any other um, suggestions for the audience? So getting horses to drink, yes. Um, I am not usually a proponent of adding salt directly to the feed unless it's this scenario. I like horses to have ad lib access to a, to a loose salt or a salt block and let them lick on it whenever they want. But in a scenario when I want to make sure they're drinking and almost force them to drink a little bit more, I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of salt a day to their, to their feed. I'm not gonna add it to the water. I'm not gonna add electrolytes or anything to the water because I wanna make sure that they're drinking. Now, if your water has a funny taste or you've moved to a different location and the water has a funny taste, I know some people People will move their horses from their farm that they have during the summer and they move them to a boarding stable over the winter time because there's more um, stalls for them to go in. And if the water's different, then definitely, you know, you can use a little palatability agent in the water, some, some flavoring. But I like to wet everything, wet all the grain, pellets, whatever you're feeding the horse, do the wet, wet beet pot mash and add about a tablespoon a day of salt to the feed to force them to drink water. It's hard to know how much they're drinking when you use the automatic orders. So also um, using water buckets to determine water intake is good. Perfect. And um, Chelsea would like to know, would a slow feed hay net be a good option for a horse that is getting minimal turnout due to the weather and is showing signs of stress? This horse eats very quickly regardless of amount. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. And don't be afraid to put three or four different slow feed hay nets in all parts of the stall to get them to walk around and do the bit of that mimic that grazing behavior. Don't be afraid to put some Timothy in one, some local grass in another, a little bit of alfalfa in one, you know, put variety in there as well. And if you feel that the slow feed hay nets just aren't enough to slow him down, put a grazing muzzle on him too. Um, and he can he can pick the hay through the grazing muzzle and the slow feed hay net. But anything you can do to make sure that he is continually just nibbling away um, <clears throat> and not standing for large, long periods, then that's ideal. Perfect. And um, Nancy would like to know how important it is to feed more than one variety of hay to get different nutrients. It's not necessarily about getting different nutrients because we know it doesn't matter whether the horse is eating timothy or orchard grass or alfalfa. It's going to be deficient in selenium, copper and zinc and most likely phosphorus these days. It's more about um, you'll notice, uh, you know, some grasses are re really leafy. Others are a little bit more stemmy. Um, it, we know that the actual physical mechanical makeup also um, aids in that um, peristaltic contraction, the, the muscular contractions that push the, the forages through the gut. Um, <clears throat> and it's just mental variety as well. Okay. And Megan would like to know, what should you do to combat a barn that chooses to feed the entire barn what they call, quote unquote, wheat, wheat hay, but in all essence, it was wheat straw. How badly can this affect the herd? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to gather my thoughts and give you a very politically correct answer. So um, 
I probably wouldn't stay at a barn that was feeding the horses straw if that's in fact what they were doing um, because you're going to really increase your risk for impaction colic and you'll notice that you would really have to feed a lot more grain to maintain body weight on the horses over the winter time um, and that's not cost effective so it's really much more cost effective to feed a good quality hay now if you have a boarding stable full of fat ponies then no you're not going to find the most leafy nutritious hay but you still want to make sure that it's a little bit digestible so that you're not increasing your risk for digestive for impaction colic so okay uh, Don would like to know does feeding hay prior to grain help reduce feeding time anxiety or help with digestion you know what, I did a little anecdotal study at a facility in New England, and we did find that getting to the barn first thing in the morning and just walking down the shed row and throwing everybody some hay, um, just quickly doing that, and then going into the feed room and getting the feeds organized and then putting your feed out, actually did slow down their rate of intake and just decrease some of those more like uh, anticipatory behaviors the pouring and the whinnying and that kind of thing I mean most horses still know the grain is coming but it did it did negate some of it a little bit and it's easy you just run down throw some hay real quick and it doesn't have to be all the hay even though just you're just throwing a flake in each stall then you're going to the feed room getting all your feed ready feeding the feed and then you know giving the rest of the hay putting it in hay bags or whatever you want to do for the rest of the day yes it can um, negate some of that anticipatory behavior okay and Patty would like to know what are the best supplements, let's see, to use to help prevent a colic episode? Oh, wow. Um, you know, well, we get all different kinds of colics. Um, and I've really focused more on the stress related colic and how we might be able to mitigate some of that stress by changing the way we feed horses. Um, but adding a probiotic, live bacteria, um, a live yeast culture, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, having that in, in your digestive health supplement. Um, prebiotics, beet pulp is good, but also things like moss and foss are going to bind up bad bacteria and help feed those bacteria. Um, it, it's really not a black and white do this or don't do that. It, all, it, it really also depends on a lot of other circumstances. You know, is this horse coming back from colic surgery where everything's being killed off and we need to repopulate all bacteria? Or are we, you know, just looking at a horse that may have some stress? So we've got a lot of lactic acid bacteria. So in that case, you wouldn't want to be feeding a lot of lactic acid bacteria. We just want to be focusing more on the yeast and the, the prebiotics. So. Okay. And Kay is wondering, can you say something about colon issues in older horses, how the colon change in older horses, how it changes and how that may contribute to colic? So the colon in, you think about a young horse and an old horse kind of in a similar vein. The young horse is developing their bacterial population. They're developing their intestinal lining and the strength and integrity of their gut. And the old horse, it's just slowly starting to break down. You know, over the years, they've suffered a lot of stresses um, and maybe got some thickening of that colon wall. So older horses need a lot more really digestible fiber in their diet. Um, so we really don't want to be feeding older horses a lot of really stemmy, non-digestible, poor quality hay because it can be abrasive on that large colon and it's they're just a little less able to digest it. Okay. And Bree was wondering if you have any suggestions um, for dry pastures full of sand. Mm -mm -mm. So, you know, I, I work a lot in different areas, California, Florida, where it's very sandy. And one of the things that horse owners fight often is sand colic and what can they do for that? And then I mentioned putting the feed close to the ground and it's like, what? She's crazy. She's going to cause sand colic in my horses. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are certainly options. You know, when your horse is in the stall, it's not bedded on sand and using rubber mats and using big feeders, um, 
you can keep it up off the ground, just trying to get it lower to the ground. If you're using the sand clear type products and don't use the ones that you feed a little bit every day and expect it to just be kind of um, working like that, you need to feed large quantities. Mostly it's psyllium based and you need to feed large quantities every one to two months. Um, but don't feed your horses directly off the dirt. But as okay. low to the ground as possible. Perfect. And um, we have, our time is about up. So let's just go ahead and do one more question and then we'll go to selecting our winners. So um, Bob is wondering, says I winter in Florida and they have peanut hay down here. I understand it is close to alfalfa. What is your opinion? Yes, Bob, that's correct. So there is perennial peanut hay, and if cut at the right time, it certainly can have a lot of the same characteristics as alfalfa. It's very high in good quality protein because it's a legume. Um, cut at the right time, as I mentioned, can be nice and leafy, quite digestible. But if cut at the wrong time, um, if it's really just the straw left over from <laughs> from the peanut harvest, then it's just like any other straw and is useless. So it all comes down to the quality of the peanut hay that you're feeding. Um, okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, we actually had a really great opportunity to get a lot of questions in, and I know there are a lot that we didn't answer, but um, we will um, work with you guys to try to get those wrapped up later on. So before we wrap up, let's go ahead and announce our winner of free product coupons. And the winner for today's webinar is Lynette Courier. So congratulations, Lynette. We will email you to get mailing information for sending out coupons to you. And if you, like I said, if you don't, if you had questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, um, please go ahead and contact Stanley's customer relations team. Uh, the phone number and email are available on this final slide. You can find past webinars, more nutritional white papers, and other great information, including the Stanley Barn Bulletin blog and some great tools to help identify what type of forage is best for your horse and how to optimize their diet on our website at stanleyforage.com. Some of our previous webinar presentations have included beet pulp, what is it and why do horses need it? When quality hay is in short supply, what can I feed my horse? Should I be concerned about feeding alfalfa? And many other great topics. So please check those recordings out on our website if you missed them before. And when you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you would complete that for us. Your feedback really helps us to create better webinars for you and helps us identify some great topics for future webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. The recording should be available for about a week following today's webinar, and then it will be available on our website under nutritional resources. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubitt, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.